You talk golden to me. Welcome to another episode of the Talk Golden to Me video podcast show. Your host, Evan Golden, a.k.a. Golden TV, as always, here in Boca Raton at the Berman Law Group Studios. Thank you for joining us, whether you're watching or listening today. We have a very interesting guest. It's kind of an interesting story as you see her profile if you're watching. Her and I are longtime mutual friends of friends, and we're Facebook friends, and she had an interesting profession on her Facebook title that I've never seen before. It was a sexologist. And I was like, what is a sexologist? Who are they? What do they do? How do you become one? And that's why I brought her here on the show. Get off of my face. This is Sharmila Sue. <laughs> She's already giggling. She's excited to be on here. You look fabulous, by the way. This is... Uh, I'm so bad at some of this culture stuff. Is this an Indian outfit, I'm assuming? Yes, yes? Okay. Indian. We'll stick with Indian. Okay, so... I can apply to many, and thank you. I wore all my gold for you. I love it. Thank you so much for wearing your gold and participating in the aura and the essence and the power of gold and golden. So I appreciate you doing that. You look awesome. Thank you. Now, this is... A, is this like a customary Indian outfit? Is this what they wear like every day in India or is it special occasions? Uh, rich people would wear this every day. <laughs> so this is like a fancy outfit we're talking here. Yes. So like in the Bollywood movies or bridal wear, things like that, celebrations. Well, you do they have this in men's versions? We'll look for that after There's the show. There's a different version, and it can be as glittery and gold as is suitable for you. Awesome. Well, you look fabulous. Thank you for coming in here. You're like, okay, this guy is my Facebook friend. We've never really met. We've had mutual friends. He saw the word sex, and he already automatically wants to talk to me. I mean, what, what's the, t the statistics? How many times are guys saying the word or thinking about sex on a daily basis? Do you have like any of these numbers? Uh, so I don't have numbers, and I've heard statistics, and I, the way that I view sex is life, so that would leave the answer for only all the time. <laughs> that, that is fair enough. We're going to get a great education here from you today, I hope so, because I don't even know what you studied in. I didn't know they offered that course or area of study. I don't know how many people are, you're educating or teaching and healing and improving their lives. It sounds like you could be like a marriage saver. I don't know. I'm just jumping to conclusions. So let's back up and tell us a little about who you are, how you found your passion. Okay. So. Dig deep. Yeah. This question. <laughs> there's always so many different ways to answer it because Absolutely. I wear a lot of hats. And right now in society, I believe that, you know, that, that saying, uh, master, master of none and jack of all trades. No, like now it's time to be a master of many trades. So for me personally, I started learning as much as I can in the healing arts area and mental health. And uh, in my journey to heal my body, I learned about sexuality and sexual wellness. And in the spiritual healing journey, I, it's like I cracked this area where around sexuality, because I used to be, I'd say, a scared Christian for a lack of a better term, I didn't see anything outside of the church. And I'm like, this is God, this is it. And I'm there having orgasms while you know the choir is singing. And I'm like, why do I feel this way? And I'm like 11 years old, okay. So I'll, I'll also insert that uh, I'm, not a, I'm an advocate for letting go of shame and releasing the stigma or taboo that is around sexuality. And it's just so interesting because there's a huge taboo in Western culture here in uh, America specifically it's like sex sells and then yet when sex is spoken of it's oh naughty naughty it's funny because my the last guest we just had on my show is so mad that the whole free the nipple movement where on Instagram guys can sh you know be topless have a shirt off but if she shows a little bit of areola or nip she's getting flagged or suspended her account and I understand kind of the stigma and what's going on so I want someone like you to educate our viewers, our listeners, and the whole community and the public. And let's kind of break these walls and these barriers because mm. it, it, it's healthy. It, it's, it's, it's normal, obviously. And why is there, why is it this forbidden fruit that it's part of our culture, it's part of who we are, but we can't, we can't talk about it, we can't profile it, and we can't share it? Thank you for that, for that question. And specifically, I like the idea of the forbidden fruit specifically in uh, Western culture where it's shamed, sexuality is shamed or taboo or naughty, good or bad. It's judged, even though it's prevalent. And my, my answer is going to be different from many, as I am different, and that's why I'm here. So the idea that sex is taboo is I see sex as a superpower. And this doesn't necessarily mean to 
fuck everyone and everything to get what you want type of thing. So it's not uh, the stigma that I see in Hollywood where it's like, oh, pussy power means you can seduce a man. Instead, mastering sexuality or my relationship with sexuality is about shifting the identity of what I see and view and experience as sexuality or sexual energy. So I'm gonna get into the woo-woo spiritual stuff of it mostly because that's what guides me. So when I say I see sex in everywhere, everything in life, it's because uh, from, similar with yoga, there's something called the uh, chakras. These are energy centers in the body that are responsible for different emotions, physical symptoms, and even spiritual insights. And so when I got to the sacral chakra, which is around the navel area, which all men and women have, I saw that this is where creation energy is, like creative energy, the energy that gets me to wake up in the morning and say, I wanna do this job like you, what, what got you here? And I found that that same center of energy is also responsible for manifestation. Uh, there's something called law of attraction. Ask and it is given, you attract what you think, you, you are your thoughts, thoughts become reality. And I'm like, holy shit, because I used to want to be the Indian Oprah or like a mix of Howard Stern meets Oprah meets Chelsea Handler, just the slutty empowered version. <laughs> the world <laughs> needs that. That, that. that would be a hit. That's, that's exactly it. Plus all of me, which is this. Well, the world's going to find out who you are today. I'm excited. <laughs> Thank you. You've been I'm hiding. Really happy. Hmm, I don't know that I've been hiding. I've been living. Uh, my, my journey's been wild. So I had a big mental health journey from, I'd say, as far as I can remember. Childhood. Did you have a, tra a traumatic experience early on and that's why you've turned to this and learned? Um, not necessarily. So that's where usually I see a lot of sex educators uh, step into this path because they're like, well, I was raped or abused and I want to help people. Hmm. Like, sure, I've experienced some situations like that. And it's not what drove me. What drove me is I was experiencing symptoms of depression. And when I would, when I would even need to go to uh, an appointment for a psych, my, even my father would have to like bring a toothbrush to make me brush my teeth in bed. And he would have to take off work to drive me, even though I was perfectly capable of driving. So I was so depressed that this energy to just get up and go, I, I, I'm like, I, that I just don't care enough to go, that I'm not going to go. And so I would actually masturbate to get energy <laughs> to like, like become alive so that I could even make my appointments. And this is when I was completely unaware of energy. Wow. I haven't heard of that tactic before. That's, <laughs> that's very unique. Well, it'll be different for men and women. For men, uh, they tend to, their energy decreases after orgasm, whereas women, it increases. It's funny because I don't really like morning sex. Don't. Not really. And guys prefer that. They're waking up ready to go. Yeah, but it's it's quite silly because then they're giving away their energy when if they came at night to go to bed, that'd be great. Wow. So do you hear that? No more morning sex for our male viewers and listeners. You're just depleting your energy for the day. <laughs> Let that build up. Have a nice romantic date. Is that is that what you recommend? Or nooner? No, you no. Can't I'm, wait that long. I'm not about the uh, no fap. I I believe that men should be able to ejaculate and enjoy orgasm, and with some education of how to uh, shift the identity of sexual energy into life force energy into prana chi. This is the energy that comes from spirit or even uh, sound waves. The most energy. The the higher your energy is, the higher your sexual energy is so which what energy are you feeling from me all sexy all sexy all sexy a lot of sexy energy it's oh uh, now my vagina's tingling stop it already <laughs> already <laughs> well, okay. what if someone called you like you're a nympho you're a sex addict how do you respond to that uh well at one point i was so <laughs> how do i how would i respond to it would be either educate them or be like thank you <laughs> uh, that's why is, is there anything wrong with that? Is you're no. doing safe with with you no know, not too many partners, and I think that there's definitely nothing wrong with that. So what's funny is, <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't shame people for uh, sexual being sexually liberated, and I'm sexually liberate, liberated, and I'm also not having sex. So it's not uh, full celibacy where I'm like I'm celibate, I'm not having sex till X Y Z. I choose to not have sex unless it's connected and pleasurable and I feel totally safe and empowered with this person. But how much better is the sex when you have that that 
relationship, that spark with your significant other. When the one night stand where there's no chemistry, there's no build up, yeah. it's just complete, maybe just lust at one point. I mean, the sex is nowhere comparable. Well, even lust is great. I love the feeling of lust. And when I have disconnected sex, <laughs> look at Evan's face. I, I'm getting so excited. I know I cut away from my face there. <gasps> oh, gosh, I, I haven't what? I haven't achieved erection yet. I will. I'm assuming I will have multiple erections throughout this show. I'm used to my vagina tingling at any given moment, which it is. Is that even true? It is throbbing. My clit is throbbing. It's a it's a real thing. So and I don't explain the energy Tell behind me. it. It doesn't necessarily mean physical or sexual attraction. I attached to a person. Uh, you're beautiful, and that's. That's okay. Disclaimer. <laughs> okay. So what it is, is when I feel alive and when I feel in my power and I'm like, this is my, this is my area of genius. I love this. Then yeah, that turns me on. I'm turned on to life. Like I, I flirt with God. I flirt with plants. I flirt with you. Like it's just who I am. So yeah, I'm turned on because this is my shit. <laughs> now you studied, I'm reading here. You went to the Somatic Education and Coaching Institute of Somatic Sexology where is this and what is this? It's a mouthful. So this yeah. is based, Did I say it even right? Uh, no, Close Institute enough. of whatever. Help me out. Yeah, you Google it uh, or go to my Facebook profile. It's tagged under my education. So this place is, right now they're doing online trainings only. And I believe they're opening it up next year because of the COVID thing that's happening. There are different, it's like a six part training. I'm still studying. And it is an online school and in person, the in person part is where you get to learn hands on healing. Where it so the idea of sexology is the body approach over the mind approach. Because in, in sexuality here in America, we'll say uh, the idea is my, the, the the mind is very powerful. And instead, if I listen to my body, my body. I just were you looking at my boobs um. or the gold. All of it. It's okay. Continue. I'm taking it all in. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, and I'm not. I'm not upset if you look at my boobs because they're great. So. I love how much confidence you have. It's such a turn on. I I really. Such a turn on. That's that's part of my journey is is building confidence, and this is through really deeply loving my body, regardless of my circumstance or what I look like in the moment or what I feel like. And I remember even. Um, when I started learning about sexual energy, I was like, shit, then I don't love myself because I didn't care about what I was eating. I didn't care about who I was hanging out with. I had this egotistical view that I'm a leader, so it doesn't matter who I hang out with. And instead, I'm like, uh, I need to protect my energy and I, I'm absorbing my environment. Like, you become your environment. And my parents, my mom would always tell me, be careful of who you hang out with growing up. And I'm like, Mom, I'm a leader. If anything, they follow me. No. And I realized later, after ha specifically after engaging in any sexual activity with someone, I would feel a different sensation in my body. I'm not talking about just with orgasm, but days and weeks and months later. And I mostly Because here, of the energy you two human beings passed on to one another? So, yeah. Uh, let's, let's look at the word sex and consider it to be an acronym for sacred energetic exchange. So what's happening is there's a transfer of energy. Like right now, even as we speak, because the way that I view sexuality is life, we are exchanging energy. So we're basically fucking right now. In some degree or another, any interaction is sex to me, right? That's why I will only do my show live in studio. I won't do the Zoom or virtual because I want to mind fuck people. Right? You don't want that cyber sex. You want that in person. Exactly. I get that. that it's brilliant. I, your way of thinking, it's so enlightening and it's... And I think that people love talking about sex more than anything, right? They love it because it's, again, it's the taboo element. But you talk about the, the connection and the energy. It, it, it's kind of, it brings you back of, of sex is important though too. You don't want to just waste it and, and, you know, get your release and move on when you could really hone in all the different elements and, and the positive elements it brings, right? Absolutely. Yeah, that's, it's connection for me. And it's also when I'm having sex with someone else, it's a shared experience. And excuse me, there's something called Tantra. And I'm, I'm not a Tantrika. I do teach about it. The, it's an ancient practice or way of life. It's like yoga. It's mind, body, soul. And it comes from India. And then there's something called um, Taoism, which is very similar. 
from, also from Asia. And this idea of Tantra originally is to connect, like using sexuality, it's a lot deeper than sexuality. It's, it's a way of life, like I said, but specifically speaking on the sex part, the idea of tantric sex is to create union between two bodies. So these two bodies, and we'll say, we'll say male and female, for example, when they come together, uh, literally, no pun intended, when they come together or even connect, just intertwine and relate between each other or within each other, they are merging their energies. So it's two spirits, essentially one spirit, and we're all one is the idea. And when you're taking two bodies and connecting them and interlacing in together, raising that energy, like with every breath, the frequency gets higher and higher and higher and higher. And the goal is to essentially leave the body and be pure spirit. So it's like a freaking acid trip, basically. And how important is the breathing? I always hear breathing, breathing with that type of stuff. Every single, it's the most, the most important. The breath is God. The breath is life force. The breath is the highest vibration that the physical body can hold. So a baby, as soon as they come out of the womb, the first thing that happens is what? Breath. Mm -hmm. So that, it's often called the breath of God. Uh, I'm a breathwork facilitator, and I've found that this is just something else that I studied for my own my own journey. Uh, to make a very long, long, long story short, I got super sick for, with an airborne virus called Legionnaire's disease. It put me on life support, comatose, ventilator. Uh, now I'm here, and the process was through healing my emotional body first. When I say emotional body, I mean emotions like trauma. Excuse me. Emotions like trauma, anything trauma related, and it doesn't necessarily mean like when people hear the word trauma, it's like, well, my parents didn't abuse me. I lived a pretty good life. I don't have trauma. It's like, oh, everybody's got trauma. Even just holding emotion inside and not fully allowing yourself to feel it is going to trap that emotion in your cells as cellular memory, and that is what trauma is. So the breath can move energy, which emotion is energy in motion and when the energy is not in motion and it's trapped or stuck or dense or heavy and it's in the cells that is what creates disease or disharmony or even just bitter emotions to say the least so the breath is what's going to move that because it's the breath of god the highest frequency moving through a dense space so that dense space cannot exist and in nature there's something called entrainment where if you put a dead rose next to, or a dying rose next to a beautiful bouquet, you're gonna see that dying rose start to come back alive. And so that's the same thing when we talk about somatic healing and sexual healing in the body and breath work is when the breath, this high vibration, is next to a lower or dense vibration, that dense low vibration is going to rise to meet that light, to meet that breath. That's entrainment, and so that's what's happening when when I say it's sexual healing. That's what's happening. So fascinating. Like I'm thinking, like you have sex like three or four times a day, but I don't think that's really the case with you, right? No, no, I haven't had sex since May. What is it, May, June, July, August, September, October, November? Oh, like like five, six months. What? That is shocking to me. That is shocking to me. <laughs> but this is what you do for a living. You're a sexologist. You're not practicing what you preach. Well, I think I am practicing what I preach. So it, it's sacred to me. And unless I have a real deep connection with someone, and for me, it's like, if you speak to my mind and then open my heart, then legs open. You know, my legs are already open, period, to, to God, to myself. And to feel safe with a man, and this is not just for me, but let's, let's use the archetype of men and women in general. For a man to have sex with a woman or have a woman want to have sex with them, genuine desire, burning desire, the man gets to let a woman or guide a woman to move out of her mind and into her heart. Because if she's trapped in her mind, then she's got, she's thinking and critiquing and judging and that's not very sexy. So when a masculine can actually offer that safety of, hey, I love and accept you as you are, and, and I use the word love frequently, so let's say even with scandalous sex or promiscuous sex, it's about creating, and even in the BDSM and kink world, let's use this as an example. So 
in the kink world, for a woman to open up, she's going to want to feel a sense of safety where she knows that she can fully open her heart and her legs. So even if it's disconnected sex where they don't they don't even know each other's names, let's say at a swinger party, if a woman's not trusting this man, then she's gonna she's gonna contract like her physical body will contract and and i felt it when i was having i, I was i just put the tissue between my legs i wasn't touching myself just just so you know <laughs> i saw that those eyes move okay so when oh now i'm just i'm distracted by your gaze okay it's a great male gaze though yeah I'm, I'm i'm learning i'm so intrigued like i said please continue okay so yeah the kink world uh let's say when they're not emotionally attached there needs to be safety. So in the kink BDSM world, there's a huge portion of it that is on consent. Consent is like hearing, is actually asking not just do you want to fuck, yes or no. It's not just uh, what you hear in the Me Too culture of um, I said no or stop and then that's rape. It's actually an active conversation is what consent is. It's saying what are your likes? What are your dislikes? How do you like to be touched and where? Uh, this part of your body, how sensitive is it? Is it on a scale of one to ten? Like these conversations. But you have to be pretty vulnerable and open. Absolutely, it's terrifying. Why do you think I don't have sex a lot? Shit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a lot. It, it, it's work to have this type of of uh, sex. People that are listening and are watching and they're just like, you're overthinking it. Just put it in and out, and and maybe maybe she'll have an orgasm. I know I will, and. Let's just move on with our day. Are they not? What do you say to someone that says that? I've I've lived most of my sexual life that way. I mean, from my early twenties to mid twenties, I was like swipe right, swipe right, swipe right, and I didn't even care about coming myself. Even it was, it, even it, there, I did have some awareness that it was filling a void, and I was hypersexual, um, and so we can get into that too. Is like uh, feelings of like bipolar is a is a one of, the, one of the symptoms of bipolar is hypersexuality. And now I don't use uh, terms like bipolar to describe people. I believe it's just a collection of symptoms or the way that we respond to a certain situation as we're taught to. And as a society, when I say we, by the way. So and a symptom like uh, hypersexuality, what often happens is people who are experiencing mania will go around fucking to get uh, satisfaction or fill a void and it feels good in the moment. It may not even feel good in the moment and some people are aware of that. But still seeking something outside of self to either feel something different or not feel at all. It's, um, it's similar to addiction. And you'll see people with an overactive sex drive or when I say sacral chakra, that sexual energy center, when it's hyperactive, the way that sexuality is expressed then is through sleeping around, um, through masturbating more than a person even wants to, uh, similar to the word addiction. I, I, in somatic sexology, we don't use the word addiction because that boxes people in, and then they can only be addiction or be a, an addict. So I work with a lot of men specifically on changing the way that they view porn and their activities with porn. I used to be addicted to porn. like. I don't, I don't, I mean, I was masturbating. Is masturbation healthy? Is, do you, is it something you encourage your patients? Absolutely. Yes. So I'm not, uh, in the, in the Tantra world, the, there's this idea to not, to, to withhold the sperm, like similar to what we talked about, like, oh, save this life force energy and use it later. Right. There, the, the idea is if I can, for, for myself and for my clients, if we can change the identity that they have around sexuality, then they're able to increase sexual energy, increase stamina, increase uh, pleasure in daily activities with just a breath or even taking a walk, and that can be orgasmic. A great cry can be orgasmic. So it's really feeling and, and reaching full acceptance for whatever I'm feeling, even anxiety and discomfort. Feel that shit, and then let, let yourself move through it because when the body lets it go, that's like uh, ejaculation. It's you're letting go of something that doesn't need to be there and it's creating an openness and expansion in your body and your mind and your spirit. So no, yeah, you can jack off all you want and I'll teach you how to do it mindfully so that you can get the best out of it. 
Yeah. And going back to what you said, your men clients, you have no problem with them engaging and watching porn. Why? Uh, let's okay. I wouldn't say I don't have a problem with it. It's that th my approach is to unlearn porn. So as they're watching porn, what are you doing with that? It's okay. <laughs> Still, let's keep going. Okay, cool. So as they're watching porn, I would I would encourage them to watch porn and look for body bodily responses that look like pleasure and that look like fake or like you know like acting. So I wouldn't encourage to watch porn for pleasure. And if you really just have to get off, go ahead and do it. Like, but be mindful. I mean, with the type of training that I offer, that's not something that they're going to be doing constantly. Whereas before, that's what I was doing. I mean, I would not sleep because I was watching porn because I needed to have X amount of orgasms until I felt like, oh, I accomplished it. Or if I didn't squirt, then that wasn't enough. Squirting's real? Squirting's definitely real. I've read many times everyone says it's just urine. Um, so I've tasted it. <laughs> like, so I know, and, okay, I'm like 19 years old at this time, and I, I'm using those, the, the rabbit, and this is all through clitoral stimulation, and then he's over here licking his lips. Okay, 19's legal, so I'll let it go. <laughs> so, okay, so when I squirted the first time, I remember, no, it wasn't the first time, but it, it was like, I, I need to figure out if this stu substance is real, like, what is this? Is this pee? So I specifically had mopped my floor before doing this because I knew that I was going to squirt. That was the goal. And I did. And then I sucked it up off the floor. First, I just like put my finger in taste. Okay, that doesn't it taste like water. It did not taste like pee. So it's a mixture of uh, bodily fluid that is not pee. And I don't know the, the word ejaculatory fluid. I'm not sure. Um, the science isn't there either. So it's pretty it's pretty much speculation. But there is some traces of urine in it, and I didn't find it to taste like pee, and I actually haven't tasted pee specifically, but it didn't smell like pee, and it was clear. All right, so squirting is real from the sexologist. So there are so many types of orgasm. Squirting is a female ejaculation fluid. That, it's about that simple, and it can happen through clitoral stimulation, it can happen through the G-spot, through penetration, and... There are so many different types of orgasms that don't even result in ejaculation or coming, uh, whether male or female. For me, uh, in breathwork, oh my gosh, I was in a breathwork workshop with about 40 people, and I was having an orgasm, and I'm in this blissed out state, and I remember this is at the end of the, the session where we're talking about our experience, and you know, no shame here around sexuality, so the first thing I'm like, do I say this or not? Do I say this or not? This is in a spiritual environment. Are they going to shame me? I was like, fuck, say it. That's part of your truth. So I'm like, I don't know what's going on with my vagina, but I keep wanting to run to the bathroom because I'm pretty sure I'm wet and I felt an orgasm, but my panties don't feel wet and I keep adjusting my yoga pants and they're not wet. But and, just from breath work. And yeah, and breath work, I was... I go into this blissed out state, which is literally heaven or the cosmos. Uh, going back to that healing journey of mine, I died twice. One was lung collapse, and then the other one was cardiac arrest. And yeah, big dr bomb drop, but we can get into that another time. We're talking about sex today. So when I did die, one of the times that I died, I went to heaven or home or the cosmos, and it's this uh, blissed out place where everything is light and it's just pure orgasm. It is creation energy. And so I know that heaven... I'm surprised you didn't want to here. stay there and you came back. I definitely wanted to stay there. I had a choice. My father was showing me... He actually took me to the underworld, the scary place, like a personalized hell. And he's like, this is going to be your life if you're not going to step into your power. And is, your father, your is your father's passed away? You saw yeah. him when you died? Yeah, I, I was holding his hand when he passed. He, he passed in hospice. He had a so when, you, when he passed away, you guys had a physical, actual connection. Oh, shit. Yeah, you know what? That might mean something because maybe I did try you, I, like specifically watching you hold your, ha hold your own hand. That's like, yeah, maybe I did absorb some of that life force energy as he was leaving. So when you died, you saw him and he showed, do you think, take no offenses, do you think he was in hell and he was showing you hell or he's saying there's two options in your life is he in hell you think so my, my father is light my father is pure pure light he's home 
he's home. So you can call it heaven or you can call it space or the cosmos. Uh, I've been. But you to, said it was a scary place he was showing you. So when I was in the coma, he came to me. I used to see my father before this. I, I'm a medium. I see spirits. I see angels. I see energy, things like that. So I had already seen my father. But in, in the coma, he had come to me. And he wouldn't speak to me while I was in the coma. And then the moment that I died, and I could just see him in the room with me, that's it. And like I remember being like, hey, dad, like fucking talk to me. This is really annoying that you're right there. Hello. And he would just ignore me. It was really fucking annoying, and I'm pissed off right now. <sighs> I'm letting myself feel my emotions, because that's what a somatic sexologist would do. <sighs> okay. So, yes, uh, in the coma, no communication. Then when the lung collapse happened, and I died, that is when he was speaking with me and we were able to communicate and like actually have a conversation. And that's when I, I just kept saying, I wanna go home, I wanna go home. And to home, I mean my physical body. And he's like, I get that and I'm gonna take you somewhere first so that you can see what your life is gonna be like if you go home right now. You have a choice and this is what your life will be like. And it was a lot more addiction, uh, jail, freaking on the streets it was not it was not pretty i was watching people being hurt and tortured and animals being tortured and i couldn't help them and i was fed up with it and i'm like i don't want to be here can we go home and he's like uh you, you're gonna go home eventually if you choose and i'm gonna take you somewhere else your real home and that was this cosmos place the different universe where everything was light and that's where he that's his home that's where he is now so he gave you a glimpse of two different worlds and some and some roads you could go down. Essentially, did you see him the second time that you died? Both times, yes. Yeah. Both so times he, you died, you saw he him. He was walking me through hell. So spirits are able to go to different places, and the way that spirits are expressed can be through people. It can be through uh, an object being moved. It can be through a shadow. It can be through a butterfly. Because when I when I died, I took many different forms. I, I was living as in many lifetimes. I was living in the ocean, as different creatures, and then I was a German man. I was a Japanese woman, so I would go from being this light light beam, which is pure creation, which is this sex energy, and just be like, okay, today I'm gonna go to Germany and I'm gonna fuck a bunch of strippers. And then I realized it was a really lonely life doing drugs and just fucking bitches. So I left, <laughs> and then I went into another person's body and in and out. So yeah, my dad was with me. What does your mother think about your career path now? Uh, what she thinks about it now is she's like, go for it. And she honors me for so it. So you had a lot of, <laughs> there was a lot of resistance when you first got into this with oh her? Oh my gosh, my mother is covered in shame. Oh no. But she loves me deeply and she sees that I'm helping people. So in the beginning it was, how could you, this, is, this isn't shameful. What is the family going to think? And my relationship with my mother has only deepened the more that I've come to accept myself. And I teach her just by being me. And she sees that, she, like, I'll, I'll go talk to her about um, what I'm studying and, and an experience that I have. And she's like, oh, so sex isn't just this penetration thing. And she sees my, my client reviews and the testimonies. And she's like, wow, you just helped save someone's marriage. You mentioned that. Yeah, like, there was a man who was totally disconnected from his emotions and there was resentment from his wife because she didn't feel seen and to not feel seen and accepted she's just going to push him away more and more and more and then he's like well you're pushing me away that's why the sex sucks why won't you have sex with me she's like because it fucking sucks because you won't accept me like you won't let me feel what i feel you want to fuck me how you want to fuck me when I want it slow, you don't want it slow. When I want it fast, you don't want it fast. I'm not even attracted to you anymore. This was a reality. And so for him, his shift, the way that they transform their marriage, and they, these are um, high school sweethearts too. So they're in their 50s now. And he, what his work was, was paying attention to his emotional responses and paying attention to her emotional responses and then having conversations in that discomfort. It's a, it's a very courageous act to have this type of deep connected sex. And then for her, it was also not, um, like at the moment she resented him, she had to learn how to vocalize it in a kind and compassionate way while still empowering him and lifting him up because if for a man to be insulted, that, that's, I mean, the ego is big, and not just in men, period. And if a man is insulted and when they, all they want to do is help and give and serve to a woman, that's not attractive to be like, you suck at, th at fucking me. It's like, well, then I'm going to go fuck someone else, <laughs> you know, or like, I'll just, I'll just masturbate. 
We are speaking with Sharmila Sue, the sexologist. She's educating myself, our viewers, our listeners. Very riveting, very intriguing. All right, we got some questions from some fans of the show. I hope you don't mind giving some free advice right now. Are you cool with this? Yes, absolutely. All right, you could bill me, bill me. All right, so Jared has a question. He says, how can I last longer? Pretty basics. Okay, so when you ask for free advice, interesting because it goes a lot deeper than one question could answer and it's specific to the person. So how can they last longer? There's different practices. Um, semen retention is one of them, which would be not coming as often as someone does. And there's also an area that you can hold like that, that same sensation where you're holding a shit when you gotta, when you gotta go poop. Uh, that area, your sphincter muscle, you're gonna squeeze that. So if you're about to come, then you need to, so you need to squeeze that ass. <laughs> squeeze that same muscle to not come. And, and it's a practice. So that's, that's a quick answer. And then the longer answer is it's a, there's a bunch of methods that you can practice, like breathing into your cock area, having that t to bring awareness to that pelvic area. Because the more breath you have there, the more sensation that you can expand there, the more control you can have over ejaculation or even getting hard, let alone maintaining an erection. This is from Brian. He goes, how do I know if my wife is faking an orgasm? Ask her. <laughs> Ask her or uh, follow her breath and follow her movements. So you'll feel it when she's having an orgasm because if your dick's in her, then her, the walls of her vagina are literally going to be throbbing. So you'll know. And then also watching her breath, like if she's pushing you away because of the sensation is so strong, definitely that overstimulation, it can be a symptom, or not a symptom, a sign of orgasm. And then there are different types of orgasms where a woman may be orgasming and you have no idea because it's such a subtle orgasm. Like it can happen uh, when I take a breath, just my heart opening right there, that's an orgasm. I've been, since I was a kid, I was able to orgasm on command and I, I didn't realize what it was, but it was the breath. So there's different types. When I breathe through my nose, out through my mouth, it feels better than just being a mouth breather. Like when I get a good breath right through that nose, I feel like it's going into my brain and I'm bringing all that. Is that, am I just imagining that? It could be. No, not, not that you're imagining it. Absolutely. So you can breathe in through the nose and when you get it through the back of the throat, like and you really feel it in the back of your throat going into your body, that's that's yogic breathing or pranayama. And then there's also conscious connected breathing, which is in and out through the mouth. So that's the maximum amount of breath that you can get in one breath with the least amount of effort. There's so many different ways to breathe and India teaches like freaking hundreds of them. Question number three, Michael wants to know, does size really matter? So we were talking about this earlier when I used the term king cock. When I say king cock, I don't necessarily mean uh, monster cock or what you see in porn. I mean uh, a, a beautiful man in every way, mind, body, spirit. So does size really matter? I had one, I remember the first profound sexual experience where I, I remember just having the best fucking sex ever. And I hadn't even had an orgasm at that time in my life. I've only had started having orgasms about two years ago, by the way. And it, yeah, as a sexologist too. So um, he was like three and a half, four inches, and it was amazing. I don't know what it was at that time. I was like 20 years old, so I don't remember too much. And it was just the way he fucked me. He just fucked me really good, and my vagina was really wet and open and some of the best sex ever. And then I've also had sex with someone with like a 12 and a half inch dick, which was painful. And... Yeah, no, I, I, I personally don't love porn star dick. I like some average dick. All right, so that is great news for all the <laughs> average men out there. Question number four is from one of our female viewers or listeners. Her name is Carrie. She said, I cannot stop thinking about other men when I'm having sex with my husband. Ooh, perfect. We were just talking about that with a friend who asked uh, the question, thinking about other people while we're having sex. That is totally common, and it doesn't necessarily mean that a person has de desire or lust for someone else. So what's happening is we have uh, the mind is the conscious mind and the subconscious mind. Now, the conscious mind is where I'm choosing what words I'm saying right now. Now, the subconscious mind is the programming that has taught me 
what words to use. So the subconscious mind is picking up millions and billions of bits of information all at once. So it is so common to be having sex with someone you love and desire, and then all of a sudden I'm thinking about my mom. You know, so it doesn't necessarily mean I wanna fuck my mom, it's just the, the mind is receiving information and yeah. I could go deeper into that, but let, let's move on. Great, uh, another question, this is from Craig. He says, I want to bring in another girl with my current wife. I'm scared to ask her if she takes it the wrong way, she could leave me, divorce me. It's something I really want. Should I approach it? Should I ignore the fantasy? Sexologist, help him out. So I would not ignore it. I would, I would definitely talk about it. And before even bringing up the conversation that you want to have a third partner or, or whatever, or even desire for someone else, there needs to be a safety in, in talking about vulnerable subjects, period. So this is more about deepening your emotional relationship with your partner to be able to ask such vulnerable questions. And th these are simple questions like, not how are you? It's how are you feeling right now? How is your heart right now? How is your breathing right now? What are if you say that you're aggravated or uncomfortable? Is this because of me or is it? Are you feeling this in general? Because the, often the uh, idea is if something's wrong with my wife, it must be my fault. Or as a man, the idea is how can I fix this? Sometimes it's not necessarily. Uh, women don't want to be fixed. They want to be held with safety. That hey, I'm allowed to feel my emotions, and. I want to be able to express them to a man. So when she feels safe to express how she truly feels, that's when you can bring up that conversation. It takes practice, and yeah, therapy would help with that. All right, excellent advice. Appreciate all these answers. All right, our last question, this is from a Seth. He says, I know I'm not gay, I'm married, I love vagina, but I also like looking at other male genitalia. Am I really gay? Why do I like this? So you could be gay or you could not be gay or you could be bi. I have a theory that every single person in the entire universe is naturally bi. I believe that uh, the human genitalia is beautiful, human bodies are beautiful, and because of social programming or conditioning, uh, especially in Western culture, is taught this is what sex looks like, this is what attraction looks like. and in school, even sex education, we're not taught about sexuality or gender or preferences. Um, so it's possible that you may be attracted. Like, I predominantly like men, and I also am turned on by looking at women, and I don't prefer to have sex with women. So I just say, I'm sexual, and that's it. Excellent answers. I appreciate you yeah. sharing uh, your wisdom with some of our viewers and fans. They were excited for you to be on here. So they've been emailing us some of these questions, so I appreciate you answering them. Now clients, patients, people that want your assistance, need your teachings, need your healing, how can they reach out to you and book a session? So I prefer through my email, which is charmilamedicine at gmail.com, and I trust that you'll have my name typed out in there. Uh, the best way to keep up to date with content, at least just to learn, is through my Instagram, Charmila Medicine, uh, my YouTube, Charmila Medicine. I have a long talk on Tantra and sex in general. Uh, the way to work with me, my website is charmilamedicine.com, and I'm, okay, I don't update my website often. I really don't give a crap about it. It's more like for professionalism. So just reach out to me, email me, say, hey, this is what I'm interested in learning from you. Let me know where you found me. Be specific with what you want to learn. My email is confidential. I have a password protect. Don't worry about that. And uh, I would basically send them a questionnaire to see if we're a good fit and get on a call. Could you do like, you could do a Zoom, you know, meeting, right? Yeah, well, I do. I, can, I do it on the phone or on camera. Great. So uh, some people don't want their, uh, they want anonymi anonymity and I respect that too. So it can be just voice and that's totally okay. Uh, I have a confidentiality agreement for them to sign. And it's also important that I'm the right person for them because sometimes I may not be and I have a whole team that I can refer out to when those people are more appropriate. C complete professional, you are healing lives, you're saving marriages, you're bringing back love, you're making sex great again. I don't, really, <laughs> don't wanna say that, but it, it is great, but I think it's something that people need to talk about more and bring to the table more. So I appreciate you being a fearless woman, confident woman, and sharing your insight and wisdom. Um, still so many more questions, because I think it's something you never say, I know it all, right? You're always right. learning, right? You're always growing, you're always finding out as you get older and your body changes. So this is something you have to upkeep, right? Right, yeah, I call myself a researcher more than anything. I mean, I'm a hypnotherapist, NLP practitioner, somatic sexologist, all of these different things. And really, I just use whatever is on my tool belt that's necessary for the person at the time. 
you're brilliant. I, 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 I have such an admiration for you Thank and you. what you're doing. It's awesome. And um, you chose a great career path. Awesome. Thank you. It kind of chose me. <laughs> people just you're kept enjoying. Coming to me I mean, for it's it. so rewarding. I mean, we were talking about off camera how many people's lives you've saved and healed. So, you're, it's rewarding. It's look, without what's the difference between a friendship and a relationship? Is the sex, isn't it? I, I uh, the level of intimacy. Yeah. The, right. The commitment. The commitment. Really. The commitment. Right. And adding intimacy to it. So if there's if so there's. So I think intimacy is in both. I want it to be in both. That erotic, erotic is is the. Well, you don't want ero oh, Okay, so erotic in the relationship, right. but that, you don't need the erotic. I want I want to point that out because sexuality is everywhere, and just because I'm talking about sex doesn't mean that it's sexual. I can be talking about sex, and I'm talking about uh, children. You know, the children's sexuality. It, there's a difference with eroticism when we're talking about the act of penetration and things like that, or lust incorporated. Still so much to learn. We will definitely be bringing <laughs> you back on the show. I uh, appreciate Thank your you. time. Viewers and listeners, I hope you enjoyed this immensely. It was it was, it was was awesome to me because it's just so enlightening. It's so, like, spiritual, and I just want more and more and just learn and learn. It was just it, – it's fascinating to me when you could just have a nice, open – conversation with someone about sexuality and stop being ashamed of it and learn from it and improve your lifestyle be Thank healthier so and happier much. Thank you so much. Follow her on all her social media. We'll be plugging it online. So follow her, engage, write her emails, book her. She's going to get, she's going to be slammed after this show. People are gonna be, I'm definitely going to be uploading more stuff on YouTube. So that's, that's Share your knowledge. Binge. Please do. I think you have a lot of homework to do. You're not, you need to be sharing a lot more because you are filled <laughs> yeah. with just so much insight, so much wisdom. So viewers and listeners, thank you for joining us. As always, we appreciate your time. Talk on me video podcast here in Boca Raton at the Berman Law Studios. Always a great time. Just learning about our guests inside out them. Never had a really chance to have a conversation with her. We've been Facebook friends for years and years. And we finally got to find out what Sharmila is all about, the sexologist. You are an amazing woman. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank right, you so let's much. Let's make out. <laughs> is that, we're not ending the show like that? No, no, no. It's COVID. Let's wait that. COVID is in the house. Thank you so much. We out of here. Peace. Ciao.